morning. Wilkinson here. Today, my podcast guest is Chris Hassett. And who's he, you wonder? Well, I know him from Art Connections. We met, I think, at an art gallery that he was at once. And I know him as a musician, and we're Facebook friends, but I think he came to my house for a party once. But other than that, we're not good buddies. Uh, very interesting guy. And I thought, hey, you got to be on my podcast. So here he is. <laughs> Say hi, Chris. Hello, everybody. Glad to have you here. Thanks. So tell us some of the things you've done, and then we'll dig into some of it. Oh, sure. So, so what are you about? Well, now I think of myself as a singer-songwriter, because I've got quite a few albums to my credit, and I like to write my own stuff and interpret my own words in, in singing. But um, I'm also an author. But I really started off um, as, as a young adult, as a high school math teacher and a swim coach, and swimming is still an activity that is very central to my life. But I went on to get a, it was a master's program in communications, so I got into communications policy and lecturing, and then into marketing communications. I was a desktop publisher for a while and eager to publish other people's books and explore their creative process. And then I wrote a book of my own with uh, my minister friend, and that was some years ago, but I'm still very proud of it, and I think it, it still explains a lot of who I am and what's important in my life was in manufacturing for a dozen years in San Diego and then went back to more freelance marketing, agency work, PR. And then I got to that age in my late 50s where I wasn't nearly as attractive to employers as I always thought I had been. And uh, it was a little more of a struggle. So I kind of limped along, uh, but I, I did enjoy a three and a half year stint at the Apple store in Escondido and some of the freelance work I did. Now I'm, I'm very, very much retired, although I stay busy with involvements uh, here in Palm Springs. I, I work at art galleries. I'm currently at a photographic art gallery in downtown Palm Springs, and I'm still very active in my music. I sing pretty often on my Facebook and Facebook page, and I'm working on my sixth album, which uh, is a collection of original love songs that kind of explain to maybe the, the current chapter uh, of my life. So that's where we are. So you're in the love stage? Yeah. <laughs> once again, yeah, once again, exploring uh, the new iterations uh, of love, uh, which I, I think is a worthy pursuit. Well, we can talk about some of that. So tell us about the book. The book is called Friendship Chronicles. I published it through my own publishing company in 1994, and it was co-written with my friend, minister, running buddy, singing buddy, uh, lifelong friend, Tom Owen Toll who is still in the San Diego area. So we don't see each other as much, but for about seven years, uh, we wrote letters to each other. And that grew out of a friendship that was already twice that long. But we had great running conversations uh, when we ran and when we ever got together. And I was very impressed with his presence in the pulpit. Uh, the First Unitarian Universalist Church in San Diego is a very progressive minded, uh, liberal uh, religious community, and I was raised in that faith tradition, so I was thrilled to move to San Diego and find that Tom and his wife Carolyn had such a vibrant ministry, and I was lucky enough to get close to him and her. And as Tom and I got closer and closer, we <laughs> just <laughs> astounded each other with the richness of our conversations when we ran, and, and we said, you know, we really should memorialize these in some letters, and I said, oh, I love writing letters. Let's do that. So after we collected about seven years of letters and about halfway through that process, we thought, you know, there's something worthwhile in this that I think would speak to other people. I think the subject of male friendship, as fraught as it can be with uh, sexual dynamics, power dynamics, uh, role dynamics, just pure friendship and how it grows and what it goes through might be a really, really worthwhile thing to pursue as a book. And so we started the process of laying out a book that would uh, represent all of the different types of letters we were writing to each other, and we grouped it in, into topics, so it has separate chapters. It is peppered with really lovely little illustrations that reinforce the messages that we're sharing in those letters, and it's something that turned in, into a series of evening presentations uh, where Tom and I could go around either to different church groups, men's groups, community groups, and read from the book, read letters, maybe write a fresh letter to each other to make the evening more of an event, sing some of the songs that I was writing during that period of time in my life, 
and it was a, an enriching experience for us from the feedback we got. It was, it was, a, it was a very enriching experience for the people who attended. So I, it's something I'm very, very proud of. And I often wonder, well, when's my second book coming out? I guess there I better go. write one. <laughs> well, the subtitle on the book is Letters Between a Gay and a Straight Man. So he was married or is married. So that must mean you're the gay one, right? Exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> I will confess to that. <laughs> okay. All right. You went to groups, men's group and church groups. I meant it measures men's group and church, or was it? There was. Mixed? Yeah, there was. Okay. In, in fact, independent from the letter writing and the friendship that Tom and I had, he, uh, shortly after coming to the church, he wanted to start, and this was in the late 70s, a gay straight uh, dialogue with opportunities for everyone to participate and face whatever anxieties and uh, preconceived notions they had about being gay or, 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 or straight and bridge those gaps with, with uh, really comfortable, well-protected, but somewhat bold conversations with uh, other people in the group. And, and it was uh, really, a, I think, became a real strong force within the, the church that, that gave everyone a, a real sense of progress and purpose. And uh, I, I was very pleased to be a part of that. I was independently in a group with Tom and about a hand, maybe six other men, and we would gather once a month and have very deep uh, discussions about uh, men's issues. Tom had been active in men's issues uh, for, for quite a while, so he definitely was kind of a, a first speaker in that situation, but we all interacted as peers. Mm. So when you went and spoke to groups... I imagine you had a question and answer period at the end sometimes. Oh, right. Yeah. Once we had the book. Okay. So, yeah. So the yeah. book's out, you're, you're going and you're doing, did you do like a book reading or did you bring the fresh letter when you did that? We, we, we did both. I usually had pre-printed up the letters. So it was easy to, to, to read from usually at, we had like a, a twin stand so we could very easily glide from, from one of us to the other. Cause we tried to find those letters that were emblematic of the type of dialogue and the, right. and the strength of the dialogue we were having uh, in the book, made sure we had some humor, uh, some drama. Both of us had experienced death. Well, you, I mean, you're gay, so you're going to have some drama, right? I, I, exactly right. <laughs> yeah, I, I insisted on that. <laughs> okay. So at the Q&A time after you spoke, were there any questions from the listeners that surprised you? Yeah, there absolutely were. And sometimes from people you thought you knew well, but you know, here they were in a forum where suddenly they could ask that question. They always wanted to. Um, we were giving a, a presentation at a general assembly uh, out here in Palm Springs, actually, maybe a year after the book. And, and someone uh, very courteously, but pointedly asked, um, because they knew me just well enough. They said, you know, you've been a coach, you've been a teacher. How can you feel fulfilled in your life without having children? And I, I wasn't going to take it as a, you know, a, a critique, right. but it certainly was a challenge, which I was more than ready to handle. And I said, well, to be honest, that's one of the, the disappointments of my life is that I wasn't able to be a father. I, I'm, which makes me thrilled to see so many gay couples right. have wonderful families now, um, you know, picture book families, but, you know, wrestling with the same thing that all families do, raising kids and teaching lessons and being respectful. And But no, I do still ache a little bit over that, but I've got plenty of nieces and nephews and grandnieces and grandnephews. Right. Um, you, you know, you can't have it all. And that's absolutely fine with me. But I'm thinking if you weren't a gay man and they asked that person to ask that question. So how about somebody that just chooses not to have children? I mean, would that question have been appropriate? Think about it. I oh, mean, they're, they're uh, a couple, they're married and they don't have any kids. How would, how would they have responded to that? It's, it seems a little bit odd to me, but well, no, it, and I, it was odd. And like I said, I, I chose not to just react to it because I honestly, I just took the question and looked inside myself and I thought, well, how do I feel about that? Mm -hmm. And so I knew what I had to say. I wasn't going to, you know, quote, take the bait. Um, right. If in fact it had been kind of thrown at me as a, as a criticism, you know, there's uncertainties in everyone's life. Right. There, there's doubt in everyone's life. So, right. but for Fair. the most part, all of the questions that we got were people eager to share some torment in their own life and how healing it was for them to read about friendship between a gay and a straight man. 
and that it gave them hope that maybe they could build some bridges in their own life. I mean, those those are the kind of uh, responses from the from the groups that touched me the most. And then always after the microphones are off and we're mingling with the crowd right, and pouring right. some coffee or something else, we have a chance to expand on that a little bit. And and I could see that uh, it, it really touches people whenever you share genuinely. And as a gay and a straight man up there at a time when that was a little unusual to explore friendship, it was it could be powerful. And I, I was aware of the power that we kind of had in our hands and I think we both used it respectfully. So when you're in the process of doing the letters, did Tom say anything that shocked you or surprised you or did I, you know him well enough that i think were, i knew him well yeah, enough but yeah. um but there were certainly things not in response to letters but in in the church life uh, and in my friendship with tom where i would suddenly be taken aback by you know an attitude he might express that i just thought oh my god i thought we'd covered that already you know um <laughs> he once gave a sermon on staying together uh, the importance of, you know, having permanence in a, in a relationship, hanging in there through the tough times, you know, a, a, a topic that, that is approached from all the time. I mean, it's announced at the time someone gets married, you know, in like, and, and good times and bad. But throughout his entire sermon, he never it once alluded to uh, a gay partnership or a lesbian partnership. And the church was, you know, maybe a third gay and lesbian. So we all had to upbraid him a little bit on that, but it was it was an honest uh, omission. But it, and of course, well, how it, did he omit it? I mean, if it's a general, I think topic. it was it was focused on uh, what I learned later. He was in the process of writing a book more specifically about his relationship with his wife and some of the things that they were going through. But in the more general presentation he was giving in the sermon, that was lost on me and everyone else, uh, and it led to. Uh, you know, a wonderful series of discussions that we all had and basically like a lover's quarrel that everyone makes right. up and things move forward on a on a new level of understanding so when he said that you you didn't apply that to say a gay relationship there, it was it was too filled with references to him and her and him and her and him and her so gotcha. it was, yeah it was it was def definitely a straight relationship that he was talking about an honest mistake but huh. an opportunity for learning so you have you're on your sixth album you're writing you're True. producing now yeah okay what have you what have you learned doing all that i've learned how fun it is to create something and shepherd it through a many 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 step process ending up with a product that if not fairly close to your original vision is tremendously satisfying uh, and not getting uh, off the track somewhere along the way or giving up uh, so it, it made me it made me feel like a, a person very very tuned in to their own process that I could hang on to that original vision and, and right. see it all the way through so it was very gratifying and collaborating with other artists whether they be musicians or the graphic artists that help with the cover design or the photographer or, I, I just love the whole process I, I love the whole creative process does the vision change usually it can it certainly can there's you have to you have to take your your ego off the uh, off the dais long enough to recognize when a little motif that the guitarist decides to add really is a wonderful enhancement and you can't go back and insist on no i really want you to <laughs> You mean, I mean, like the, a, you mean like the 20 minute solo the guitarist did? <laughs> <laughs> no. I would not welcome that. No, I get it. <laughs> but you're uh, right. Yeah, no drum solos, no Inagata De Vita type right. uh, departures. But I, that's, that's the cost and the opportunity built into collaboration. And ultimately, it always comes out better. What's your favorite album? Um, it's the one that you held up in your hand this morning and says, uh, I really like this one. And that is the third album I did, This I Promise You. It was the first album I did that was all originals, uh, whereas my first album was a live concert, half originals, because I've always loved writing songs from the 80s on. But This I Promise You was all uh, original love songs, very much from my heart, and pretty stripped down production so that the words really were out in front, uh, and, and my, my voice was was out in front and so that makes me really happy and 
and it's probably why I decided the album I'm doing now is going to be another album of all originals, love songs again, but maybe more informed by my age and where I've, where I've been and where I find myself now. And you've been in love before? A few times. Talk about that a little bit. Well, I, um, you know, being a gay man who was closeted really until he was 28, that's me. Uh, I was a late bloomer, but that doesn't mean I wasn't aware of, on some level, my gayness in a society, a little town that really wasn't going to respond warmly uh, to my coming out. Wait, you but you were a musician at that time, right? No, I was a musician like I was just a, a, a singer. I was okay. not doing music. You know, music okay. was always in the margins of my life, but I've always known it's what I did best. From the okay. time I was four years old on, I was singing along with the radio and, um, you know, rock stars and, and R&B stars were my best friends uh, artistically. I just, I just couldn't get enough of it. But I, I knew that I was a late bloomer. And I didn't allow myself to fall in love. I had a lot of infatuations, but because I really couldn't communicate to that person and have a beginning and have it develop and have it grow into something more, they just stayed that way. And there was a time when I thought, I'll probably never fall in love. I mean, I was almost ready to just accept that as my lot in life. But um, at uh, 28, 29, I went back to graduate school as a way to redirect my life, really. As happy as I was teaching and coaching, and I had some lovely relationships with women in my 20s, but I knew that's not where I wanted to be uh, in my life uh, love-wise. So I'm in my late 20s, and I allowed myself to open up a little more, have conversations, get to know a guy. You know, it wasn't just about uh, jumping in bed, although that was new and exciting and f filled my life with a, a new sense of energy and, and joy. But after the first few flings, I realized I, I had the capacity to definitely fall in love, and, and I did. The first time I, I fell in love, it was in a relationship that really didn't go anywhere, but I had a chance to feel the ups and downs and the, the, the joy and the, and the desperation that sometimes can come along with a, a young love. The more important love came along in my late 30s when I had a chance to really get to know an artist friend of mine, which is probably why I love artists forever. <laughs> um, but uh, Dan and I had a, had a wonderful relationship, uh, and we supported and encouraged each other in our, in our art. He was a, a brilliant painter and illustrator, and I was doing more and more songwriting and singing publicly, uh, putting on concerts mm -hmm. and benefit concerts and things like that in San Diego. So that set a pattern for me, which I have had to repeat a couple more times. Dan died way too young, and that was a tremendous blow, as it was for so many of us when we were losing friends and lovers and sons and fathers now and are sisters. Now, his and illustrations in, in the book? They are. Some okay. of his uh, small illustrations are, are in the book. And at my home, I'm surrounded by his art. And I know there's a, a lot of people throughout the Pacific Northwest, which is where he grew up, that are that have his art in their homes as well. Hmm. So I feel real lucky to, to have that. It comforts me. And so after Dan, then what? Uh, after Dan, I, I don't, <laughs> the names have been changed I to protect the, the innocent. Give me the facts. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had, a, I've actually, after Dan, uh, you know, I've climbed out of that bit of grief and, uh, but I've, I've often noted the grief we accumulated is so overwhelming from the 80s and 90s. Um, you know, before we started experiencing the death of people who were old or other th kind of things, we had this uh, unusually terrible and cruel loss of so many young men to AIDS. So I think that in some ways um, stays with you forever. I mean, I still feel it. Um, mm -hmm. I was rereading some of the letters in the book. I knew we were going to be talking about this, and I mean the tears were flowing. It uh, as we stumbled, I stumbled upon some of the letters when I was experiencing uh, Dan's decline, and uh, right. it's it, it gets triggered from time to time. Right. But I had two 13-year relationships after Dan, and they they were great. I mean, I, I love the guys. I really did. There were, there were times when we just were on top of the world and in tune with each other and working hard and making things happen and remodeling homes and planting gardens and you know, all those things that life is made of. 
And so I, I feel as though I've had great experiences when it comes to relationships with men. So you're close to Tom, your co-author of the book. Yes. And you're now describing multiple relationships after telling me that he did a sermon on you should stick to one person. So how did that all work out? <laughs> well, Dan died, so I didn't have the I right. didn't have the no, I mean, opportunity. But the, but the next two. <clears throat> sure. Did, was there any friction on that or Oh no, there there definitely is. I mean, I I'm, I'm not the perfect partner and um I, I don't know, you know, there's so much that happens in a relationships and in 91 to 2004, a 13-year run was 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 pretty good, you know, for for a gay guy, and uh, I was going through some. I think thirteen years. So wait a minute. Yeah. I think I think that's like fifty six years of straight. <laughs> it's like cat lives or right, right. You know, dog years or whatever. Well, and, and these days, honestly, I see people on Facebook celebrating. You know, a couple of gay guys. They'll say, and this is forty one years together, and you know, I don't think that was happening twenty and so years ago, but. Now, you, there are some enduring relationships that are so inspiring. I mean, I love that. But I think to have tried to stretch the 13-year relationship I had with my guy from 91 to 2004, to stretch that any further would have been painful for both of us. Uh, we, right. we knew it was time to move on, and, and that was fine. And then from 2004 to 2017, I, I had another long-term relationship. And again, we had a great time. We you know raised a couple dogs together and moved around and uh, planted gardens and had some fabulous trips. And, and he's still one of my best friends. So mm. I, I'm hardly one to call that a failure. I mean, I think it's, I think it's pretty terrific. I'm, I'm very, very grateful for the relationships right. I've had, even though they didn't last forever. I don't know if that's the test of a great relationship. You know, I think we all have our own path and it takes us in different places. Plus yeah. we, we all change so much. So I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking back something I read in the book that kind of went, bah. To me, it kind of gave me a ping, <laughs> which was you're talking about your relationship with Tom, your your straight friend, and you said, well, we haven't known each other long. It's been 14 years at the time you wrote the book, as I recall. And then, of course, now it's 40 something years. So <laughs> I thought, I don't have time to have friends that much time. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to remember the context of that. I think when we we became almost immediate friends. So I think we both remember thinking like in the mid eighties, we haven't even known each other that long, but we are, I feel so close to you, Tom. I mean, we, we would say very loving things to each other as male friends. And we started writing letters in about the first six years of our friendship. And then that went into, you know, the, the mid nineties. Um, so I felt a closeness and a familiarity and a comfort and a, a love for Tom that was almost unusual for me to get that close to, a, especially a straight man who was not connected with the family. or Right. So I was also thinking, okay, so you're writing these letters and somewhere midpoint there you said, oh, this might be a nice book or something like that, correct? Correct. Okay, so that begs the question, <laughs> did the thought of your writing a future book influence the letters themselves. Right. Um, I'm sure it did, but we made a deliberate attempt because we already had about three years of letters to keep the tone and the level of conversation and the, the way we related to each other very much the same. And we invited the other to really be honest if they felt there was something a little contrived or a little too soapboxy or, right. you know, something like that. So having... I think having decided that this could be a book, it kind of lifted us in some ways to maybe tackle even tougher topics, but to keep it real mm. as a person-to-person -person exchange. Right. But you're right. I, I would not pretend that, oh, no, it was just the idea of a book. You know, it's not like we hired script writers or something right. else to, you know, um, and background music. But it was a challenge. But at the same time, I think it, it gave us a new impetus to see that there was an importance beyond our own friendship by continuing the letters because whether it becomes a model for other uh, friends to get closer and talk about some of these kind of things, we knew that it was an important process we were a part of and that if it turned out to be inspirational to others, that would be great because right. there was a real need for dialogue across the gay-straight gap. What was, it, a, what was a sticky point? 
Give me an example. Uh, the, between the two of yeah, us? Yeah, when you were writing back and forth. Well, he ended up writing a lot more than I did. <laughs> so just I slow saw down. Some of his, I noticed some were like two to three pages and you were more brief. I did notice that. <laughs> I said, would you slow down a little, Tom? Well, he, you know, he, he writes sermons for a living. So they're all probably, I don't know how many words are in a sermon, but you know, they're four pages double typed or something. And I... Right. I can be more explosive in my writing. I get out what I want to get out, almost like it's a quick song with a hook. You know, I, I, I know what the thought is. I put it across. And But in some ways, I think we influenced each other's writing style. And we would have separate conversations about that. And he would say, oh, God, Chris, there's such energy in your writing. And I'd say, and time, you're so disciplined, you know. And it was it was kind of fun to be that close comparing thoughts and at the same time comparing styles and and just seeing the contrast and there was a contrast we're very different people but we are dear friends and i've really never met anyone quite like him in my life what i was asking was what was the topic that were oh the topic that was kind of tricky that you had to address oh sure uh, around sexuality, there were there were quite a few, but he would always just start off saying, you know, I'm I've just never been a sexual warrior. You know, I've always had just one woman in my life and one marriage, but and and then a second marriage, and very committed, and I don't let my eyes wander. And I, of course, as a gay man and being single quite a bit of that time when I was first coming out, I had far more adventures than him, and. It didn't bother me that I was going to just jump into some of those adventures like, oh, what will Tom say? And, you know, he told me later on, he says, oh, a little taken aback. I mean, it, he knew that there's a lot of experimentation and trying different things out and multiple partners and all that kind of stuff in, in any lifestyle. It's not it's not con- constrained just to the gay lifestyle, but there was a real difference in terms of sexuality. Did you feel judged? Never. Never. I never did. So and he was more trying to understand than exactly coming right. from a judgmental yep. standpoint. Gotcha. Exactly right. And even when, as I said, he wrote, he gave the sermon that I thought was ignoring a large part of his congregation because shouldn't this be something that we could all relate to? I knew that we'd be able to have a, a, a good discussion, series of discussions and involve everyone and everyone could be heard and, and we'd get through it and we would come out stronger the other the other end and, 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 it, and it happened. We, we had some disagreements uh, about uh, literary allusions. Hmm. At one point, he was talking about how he acknowledged that he feels sensual towards men, but not sexual, and then went into this discussion about, in D.H. Lawrence's Women in Love, there's this fun, rollicking wrestling match between you know Rupert and Birkin. And I've seen that movie, and I've read that book, and it's anything but fun and casual and rollicking. It is just laced with such heavy sexual undertones that... It, but he didn't see any of that. He didn't see any of that. And I just let loose in one of my letters and said, oh, my God, <laughs> you missed it. Did you read it? You know, it was just kind of a, a amazing, and it was one of those points of departure that we could laugh about but learn from each other. Right. And it's so easy to just have your blinders on and just not let yourself see some of the richness in uh, literature or the written word that's actually there. You know, I'm sure I've been guilty of it myself. So you have a song in one of the albums, El Centro, which is that in the uh, This I Promise You? No. That, that's in the other one, right? That is in the original the first Bring one? Love Home, which was a live concert I, I did uh, with the idea that we might record it. So... We had it set up production-wise so that we could uh, run some tracks from it, and I was very, very proud of it. And El Centro was one of the one of the songs I wrote in the '80s. It's actually a parody on El Paso. Cause it's to the tune, and the and I invite everyone to go to my YouTube channel and bring it up. <laughs> um, but El Centro basically was for me Merced, leaving a funny little cow town, if you will to become who I really was. So El Centro, which is is a, is a parody on El Paso, Melody, and, and uh, I changed the lyrics, is a gay cowboy love saga where two guys who are rehearsing on the streets of El Centro to try out for a, a traveling gay man's dance group end up dancing with each other because they see each other uh, across the, the dusty road. And even though I'm in 
rhinestones and you know no 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 you weren't when he's no you had your shirt off at that point oh no i took it off at the end right i took it off at the end but i started off being kind right, of a fancy that. dancer i know I but start, he didn't he didn't oh, notice right. you until you took your shirt off come on i know that oh, i read I, this you, you could be my backup singer i mean you know the lyrics <laughs> Yeah, you're right. I start off as the kind of the fancy dancer, and he was wearing chaps, and he preferred buckskin, and he right. had this big old cowboy hat. And so anyway, there's this this mismatch. But right. I realized the way to get his attention was to rip my shirt off because the dust was just too much for my rhinestone shirt. Right. And he noticed me and came over, and we danced together, and we won the contest, got the trophy, and then we went on tour. So okay. the whole thing is uh, El Centro and... Well, curiously, I was reading your book and playing that in the background at the same time. And <laughs> when that song came on, seriously, I was reading the the part in your book where you're talking about writing the letter to the cowboy on the postcard. Oh, my and gosh. It, they, they just came together perfectly. How fortuitous. Yeah, it, was, it was really wild. <laughs> that is good. Yeah, I had a little... Yeah. I had a little fantasy letter within a letter when I wrote to Tom, and uh, he told me later. He says, "You know, I really wasn't comfortable reading about your, you know, fantasy." I, <laughs> I said, "Oh, come on, Tom. You, you knew we were going to be getting into this stuff when we started this project." But uh, that's so great that they <laughs> that ended funny? up being coincident in yeah, time. Just, it, I mean, the timing was like perfect. I love that. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> I liked it. All right, so. What's your so your new project is going to be another album? True. And when do you think that will happen? Oh my gosh, I um, I had hoped it would happen shortly after I moved out here to Palm Springs. Although it a little problematic. Um, is that like that COVID thing? Yeah, that COVID thing. <laughs> and I also yeah. realized leaving San Diego for you know just coming over the hill to Palm Springs, all my music peeps are back in San Diego. But I am taking time to get acquainted with a lot of the talent out here in the desert. But I'd worked with a studio over there and worked with a jazz trio, a couple of jazz trios over there and, and accompanists. And, uh, but I've decided that really needs to be the focus of my, of my work. I'd love to be, I'd love to have a, a club date uh, once a week somewhere, but everything can be a, a, a distraction. I, I want to focus on, on the album. I've basically got the songs in place, uh, lead sheets with, with chords and lyrics and motifs and everything laid out i just need to get down to getting some charts and hiring some musicians and getting some studio time and making it happen so, what's the title of that the new one you know i don't have a title yet but i i know it's it's going to uh, certainly announce that it's a collection of love songs so some some twist on love songs from this chapter in my life maybe desert maybe the word desert's going to come in there i don't think i'm going to reuse the word el centro because i'm no longer in el centro i'm in right. i'm in the paradise that i always wanted to be in mm. i i love it out here I just love it out here. The mountain beckoned me, and I responded. So we'll see. I'm hoping next spring I'll okay. have this wrapped up and out there, and I'll be doing a series of evenings, and, and then I'll be happy to take that a night a week at the Purple Room. Or uh, There you go. <laughs> and we'll, um, we'll include in the episode notes all your information on how to contact oh, you and all that yeah, all that stuff. It, there's uh, my website, uh, YouTube channel, and on, yeah, on Facebook, I... I sing a cappella from my kitchen. I call myself the kitchen crooner, and uh, people can kind of tune you're, you're, in. And... You're really good, by the way. I didn't Thank say that. Thank you so much. I was waiting for that to be part of our conversation. Yeah, no, I really, no, I, you're as like, I said to myself, wow, a couple times. That's nice. Listening to the album. So Very nice really to hear. Great. Thank you. It's what I do best. Right. And I like to think I'll do it just all the way for the duration. Well, the gay guys have got to like you, too. Come on. The, I, yeah, dark, I do get the, a nice the, response. The dark, the dark glasses and the <laughs> salt and pepper hair. Come on. It's a look. It's very in right now. Oh, uh, I guess so. Yeah, I'd like to say I was the first to come up with it. Wow. But uh, no, I, 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 I feel well appreciated out here in the desert. I've made some wonderful friends and mm. I, I love the whole milieu out here. It's oh. great. Any final thoughts to share with anybody? Uh, no final thoughts, really, but just... Uh, God, embrace who you are as early in your life as you can. And if the place you live or the people you surround yourself doesn't support that, change. Get yourself in a position where you can fully blossom. And uh, I was a little late doing that. I don't regret the things I did in the meantime. They all contribute skills later on. And stay youthful as long as you possibly can. Not in an artificial way, but just 
keep your curiosity, keep your enthusiasm, right. keep your ebullience, and for God's sake, be kind. Yeah. I think that's a huge lesson I've that's learned. That's a whole bunch of stuff right there. It is. It's well, all yeah. good stuff. Uh, people will just have to <laughs> play over those last 30 seconds. And I think the other thing I would add to that is surround yourself with younger people because it really helps keep you young. You know, younger people, people from different walks of life, yep. people from different races, people who are older. I mean, all that stuff. Uh, diversify right. your, your friend's circle. Be open. I I know that we've all been forced into thought camps and political camps and uh it's it's crushing me in a lot of ways i i feel the loss of spirit from being so isolated and i can always justify that isolation but i it doesn't make me feel any better i I'd, I'd like to open up doors and build bridges and that's really who i am i enjoyed having you thank you and so i appreciate much. you coming in and we're going to take a picture of you because <laughs> i'm a photographer and i want a fresh picture by me for the uh, the thumbnail. So we're going to do that. But uh, thanks again for coming in. You bet. Enjoyed it. Okay, bye. Stick around after my closing music and you'll hear a sample of Chris's work. This is one of my favorite songs on one of his albums and it's called This I Promise You from the album of the same name. Stay tuned.
do, I do.